Hello there, welcome to my channel. My name is Doug, and I'm back with another Fountain Pen Resurrection Sunday video. Happy Sunday. I must say that it's much quieter here on Sunday mornings at Inquiring Minds. There are exponentially more people watching videos about controversial Chinese fountain pens than videos on vintage fountain pens, no matter how incredibly cool some of these pens from the past are. It must be the history element. Anything older than two weeks ago is worthless. Or it could be the controversy. People love drama and love getting their collective knickers in a twist about minutiae and things they cannot control in the least. And I guess going on YouTube anonymously to call content creators idiots or tearing down a product because it doesn't fit with their jingoistic worldview gives people an elevated sense of self-importance. I've been saving some of the most interesting, insulting comments that I get on these videos by taking screenshots before deleting the comment and bopping the commenter on the head like Bunny Foo Foo on a field mouse. Little Bunny Foo Foo hopping through the forest, cooping up the field mice and bopping them over head. Hey, thank you, Butters. We'll let you know. Uh, I can do it again. We'll let you know, Butters. Well, all right then. Here's the latest amusing one. I'll read it for you. Jan Kafka writes, Quote, from the beginning of the video, you came across as a disorganized, self-absorbed idiot. I made it about two and a half minutes into the video before I decided I never needed to see your face or hear your voice again. Another channel blocked from recommendation. Thank you, Jan. I will answer by quoting your relative, Franz Kafka. Give in to the desire, Jan. My mother used to say, take it from where it comes, and you cannot build yourself up by tearing others down. My mom was a very thoughtful and philosophical woman. But I distilled that philosophy down to my own pithy comment. <laughs> and on to today's Pen Resurrection Sunday Fountain Pen. This is the 1965 Parker 61. The 61 was a huge innovation in pen filling technology in 1956. It's a capillary filler. You are all invited to see how a capillary filler works. All except Jan, that is. No soup for you! <laughs> right now. Today's Fountain Pen Resurrection is this 1965 Parker 61 Classic Mark II Capillary Filler. I'm calling it a 1965 because it could have been made anywhere between 1962 and 1969. It's a Mark II because it's 135 millimeters long and has a thick trim ring right here and has the capillary filler cell. It's a classic due to the satin Lusterloy cap. I would normally show some before photos of the pen before I restored it, but this pen hardly needed anything but cleaning. And this is exactly how I found the pen in the antique store. But what I will do today is look at some of the history of this pen, show its parts and features, show some size comparisons, some measurements, and then provide a writing sample. I did have to do some cleaning because although the pen is in pristine condition and came in the original case that is also incredibly well preserved. Let's take a look at it here. This 60s style case with Parker 61 foil stamped on the inside satin cover. Incredible shape for the age and the pen was in just as pristine condition after 57 years but it was still full of dried ink. So I placed just the part of the pen with the nib and the capillary filler into my ultrasonic cleaner filled with pen flush and soaked it and agitated it over and over again until any water I ran through the pen ran clear. Let me demonstrate for a moment what I did to help that process. And those of you with Parker 61 pens might want to do this as well because it's very helpful. I took a bulb syringe that you can get for a few dollars at the drugstore like this one here and I kept cutting the tip off until I got the opening there large enough to just fit over the end of the capillary filler. So it just fit over the end of the capillary filler like that. Then I filled the syringe with water 
fit it to the end of the cell and expelled water through the pen over and over again until there were no signs of ink. Once that was clear, I put the end of the capillary cell in my mouth and blew through it until I expelled as much water as possible. Then I inked the pen, which I will show you in a moment. And that was it, other than using a polishing cloth to polish the outside of the pen. And I was lucky because this is not a pen to be disassembled by a novice. Again, Steph at Grand Mia Pens is an excellent resource. I'll put a link to his video on this pen and how he took it apart uh, in the description of my video. He disassembled a 61 that was given to him for parts because it had no cap. And his advice was, don't take it apart. The plastic on these Parker 61s was and is brittle and has actually shrunk and warped in some examples. To remove the hood, he had to apply some heat and it's a good chance you'll destroy the pen. So professionals only, please. The best advice is to soak and flush the pen regularly. Now let's talk about the history of this pen. Here is a 1954 Parker 51, one of the most famous fountain pens in history. By 1956, the Parker 51 had been around for 17 years. Parker had changed the filling system on the 51 from the original vacuumatic to an aerometric filler like this one. In the 50s, the ballpoint pen was really beginning to catch on with its ability to write for a long time on an easy, no mess to replace refill. Schaefer developed the touchdown snorkel pen in 1952 as a way to make fountain pens easier to refill with little ink mess. And Parker was hard at work trying to find a refill system that was clean and easy. According to Parker, a team of 50 people worked for 12 years on the Parker 61 capillary filler cell. Here is a patent for the capillary cell dated from 1950. The capillary cell is comprised of a thin 50 by 140 millimeter DuPont polyethylene sheet that is perforated with tiny holes and also has tiny bumps on it to keep the membranes separate. The sheet is rolled and inserted into a DuPont Teflon tube and basically acts as a wick to suck up the ink into the cell unit Parker calls the capillary cell. The Teflon on the outside of the cell repels liquids, so theoretically you only need to immerse the cell in the ink and then pull it out with no cleanup required as the ink will not stick to the Teflon. Now some of you may be old enough to remember how amazing Teflon coated frying pans were in the 1960s, only to discover how easy they were to scratch, and then not so much. Parker marketed the 61 as the fountain pen of the future and used various stars of the day looking on in wonder as their fountain pens magically filled themselves, like Bob Hope, Doris Day, and here is an ad with William Holden, the star of many great films like Stalag 17, Sabrina, Sunset Boulevard, and Network, as well as my favorite, The Bridge on the River Kwai. Unfortunately, even with no moving parts to the filler, it had its problems. The capillary cell works very well if it is well maintained and cleaned and flushed regularly. But people aren't like that, and soon returned their clogged 61s to Parker for repair. And the Teflon also didn't hold up, as it got scratched just by opening and closing the barrel. So in 1969, Parker replaced the capillary cell with the cartridge and cartridge converter fillers they had popularized with the Parker 45 in 1960. And that Parker 61 was called the Mark III. Parker continued to make the Parker 61 model until 1963. Parker's Don Doman designed the exterior of the pen and kept much of the very successful look of the Parker 51 with some refinements. The 61 is a slightly shorter pen than the 51 with a sleeker cap and an elongated Parker clip. The 61 is quite a bit shorter posted, but the big difference is with the length of the section. It's almost 10 millimeters longer than the 51 and it has the addition of an inlaid chrome arrow near the nib, which is supposed to help you orient the pen correctly, as it was difficult on the 51 to see where the nib was when you were writing. The 61 also has an end finial, which actually contains an important part in the function of the capillary cell. Overall, the pen is a streamlined version of the already streamlined Parker 51. From the top, we see the gray plastic finial jewel that matches the end finial 
and hence the pen is called a double jewel. The conic clear plastic piece is set inside a chrome metal ring that is the top part of the arrow clip. The feathers of the arrow, which are called the fletching, are a lot longer on the 61 than they are on the 51 and the 45. The Parker Arrow is one of the most recognizable pen clips ever and is very functional. The cap is what Parker calls Lustreloy, and this one is in a matte satin finish that identifies this Parker one as a classic model. The cap tapers up to the rounded end and is engraved with Parker on the front, 61 on both sides, and made in the USA, and the oval arrow Parker logo on the back. And notice the hollow font here as well. There's a barely noticeable step down to the barrel, which is straight to almost here, where it begins tapering down to the end finial, which has that conical plastic end jewel. Inside the barrel attached to this end finial is a small spring and valve that seals the end of the capillary cell when you insert it in the barrel. The cap slips off with an even nicer slip clutch than the 51 to reveal the long tapering plastic section that has the chrome metal arrow inlaid into it at the end towards the nib. The trim ring that engages the cap and separates the hooded section and the barrel is much slimmer than the 51. Let's get a closer look at this nib. The nib is tubular in the fashion of the 51 but is differently shaped as is the feed and the ink collector inside. So 51 nibs are not compatible with 61 nibs. The section unscrews to reveal the capillary cell. There are no markings on the black Teflon sleeve of the cell. And at the end, you can see the three holes uh, where ink is drawn up. And if you look at it end on like this, it kind of looks like H.G. Wells' uh, War of the Worlds Martians, at least from the 1953 movie. The inside of the cap shows the plastic cap liner affixed to the finial with a brass screw. The cap posts deeply and securely and makes the pen an incredibly well balanced and comfortable fountain pen. Unposted, the pen is plenty long enough to write with comfortably, but this pen begs to be posted. Now let's look at some size comparisons. And here's the 1965 Parker 61 with a 1954 Parker 51, a 1967 Parker 45, a new Hero 565, and a new Wingsung 601 Flighter. Now let's look at them posted. And here they are posted. You see all of these pens post beautifully, but the 61 seems to post the most deeply and the most securely of them all. They're all hooded nibs except for the 45, which is a semi-hooded nib. And I think the sections on the 61 and the 45 are the best of the lot. The Hero 565 is a very inexpensive fountain pen. I did a review a couple of years ago on this pen, but they've since come out with an update to the filling system on it. So it isn't the awful aerometric that it was before. So you can look forward to that review coming up shortly. Now let's look at them unposted. And here they are unposted. You can see the double jewel nature of the end of the 61's barrel. And the end of the 45's barrel has a black tassie on it. And the end of the Wingsung 601 um, shows that separation between the blind cap and the barrel. It is a pump filler in the style of the vacuumatic. Now let's look at some measurements and I'll be back with a writing sample. And we're back with the writing portion of the review. But before we get on with that, let me show you this video I did of me inking this Parker 61 with the capillary filler for the first time. So this Parker 61 that I got at an antique store came in such pristine condition. Uh, there wasn't much cleaning to do. Uh, I opened it up and looked at it and I didn't see any remnants of ink or anything. 
and no scratches it just looks right out of the box like it was brand new I'm going to pretend like I'm William Holden and I'm going to dip the pen in the ink and let it sit there for a bit I don't know how many steamboats you're supposed to leave it in there but we'll leave it in 30 seconds or so and that should just about do it of course you'll have to wipe off a little bit of excess and we put the barrel back on and see whether this thing writes so the first bit I'm going to get is going to be water because obviously it isn't fully dry yet so I'm going to let this pen sit for a bit nib down and then come back to my writing okay I'm back I pushed the ink through with a bulb syringe and then recharged uh, the pen with the Waterman ink. There we go. Still a little bit watery with that Waterman ink. This is the Parker 61. And now on with the writing sample. This is Clairefontaine 90 GSM paper and this is the 1965 Circa Parker 61 and it has a fine 14 karat gold hooded nib. And let's check the wetness. Now it's decently wet, but this is not how it wrote when I first inked it up. I mentioned all I did was clean the pen and then ink it, but it tends to skip and was a little dry. The more I wrote with it, the more I wanted to do something about the nib. But again, as I said in the beginning, this is not a pen I want to take apart. I tried the Ink Acquiring Minds Seven Strokes to Inky Happiness, but there's no variation and no flex in this nib, so it was not doing anything. So I got out my gapping tool shim and was able to carefully insert it between the tines right there at the tip of the nib and was able to gently move it side to side a few times. And the difference was immediate and here's a page from my journal uh, where i was writing and it was getting fainter and fainter and lots of skipping and so forth then i did the shim with the nib and this is 30 seconds later right here quite a difference and now it writes quite marvelously now some will say you have to use a brass shim on these nibs especially if the nib is gold uh, because brass is softer than steel but my response is that number one i'm very careful and gentle and the nib tipping is not gold it is an extremely hard alloy uh, very similar to steel if not steel itself and fun fact the tipping isn't iridium and even pre-1940 pens only had a small amount of iridium in the content of the alloy so even when it says iridium tip and most especially when it says iridium tip there isn't even a trace of iridium in the tip all of that aside this non-iridium tipped gold nib now writes nicely wet and it's very smooth and a real joy to write with the nib is very very smooth and as to variation as i mentioned before the nib does not flex at all not surprising for a hooded nib and the ink today as I showed you is Waterman Serenity Blue there's no sack in this vintage pen but there's no way I would screw around with the delicate capillary cell system with anything other than a very safe ink and Waterman Serenity Blue is all that and don't even think about putting shimmering inks into this pen here are some close matches to this ink from inkswatch.com now this nib makes a 0 0.5 millimeter line which makes it a western fine or Japanese between a fine and a medium and for our quote
and some reverse writing. Very, very dry and scratchy. And some quick writing. You see, it has no difficulty keeping up anymore now that I've opened those tines up. So, my thoughts on this pen. There are so many cool things about this pen. The unique filling system, the sleek lines, the comfort and balance in the hand, they're all amazing. The fact that I got this pen in such pristine condition is rare in itself. I come to learn that Parker 51 is not as collectible or sought after as its predecessor, the Parker 51. But that makes them more affordable for ordinary people like you and me. And the plus is that they are such great writers, you might want to collect one not to display, but as a daily writer. The one caveat to using the Parker 61 as an EDC everyday carry pen is that you don't get a lot of ink in the capillary cell, and you can never know how much ink you have. It runs out quite often for me, so I wouldn't recommend taking the pen out for lengthy periods of note taking. If you take it to work for use on your desk, keep a bottle of ink next to you as you'll be dropping the cell in the ink quite regularly. And don't drop it in the ink and go about your business to come back in a few moments. It's literally an ink disaster waiting to happen. <coughs> Dunk it, count to 30, take it out, and cap your ink bottle. Trust me. And there you have it. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. And please look in the description for a link to Gold Spot Pens, as I'm now an affiliate of the online store. And when you shop at Gold Spot using my link, you'll be supporting my channel as well at no extra charge to you. You can also join as a member of my channel for only 99 cents a month, and I guarantee I'll answer your comments in the comments section, and you'll get cool emojis, badges, and sneak peek unboxing videos as well. And that just leaves it for me to say, thank you. for watching and that's all she wrote I made this